So, um, here we are, the second live broadcast I've tried here. So, uh, let me just... Uh, hopefully the colour's a bit better, and the camera position's a bit better, and the sound's a bit louder. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. Come back, don't they? Isn't that so? A familiar you tried to get into the long room today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? How do the dead come back? What's the secret? What's the secret? First thing I wanted to say was I've just had some uh, postcards produced um, as merchandise because I've opened an Etsy shop and you can see the, the uh, link at the bottom of the screen. And uh, what we found was shipping the books to the USA was phenomenally expensive because of the weight. But I know uh, a lot of the audience is actually in the US and Australia and, and other far-flung places from, from Carlisle anyway. And so I thought well, I'd get some lighter merchandise. So I took some of the um, thumbnails of uh, favorite thumbnails that people had commented on. It says on the back, it says, uh, I don't know if you can read that there, you probably can't. Oh yeah, there you go. It says, uh, Happy Hauntings from the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. So that one was used in um, All Hallows by uh, Walter de la Mare. That one was the most recent Dracula one by Bram Stoker, obviously. And this one was The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde. And I've had a little sticker done as well, so you can peel this off and stick it on your laptop and things like that. So I was going to read you two stories tonight. I said I was going to. I'm still going to read you two stories, if I can find my glasses, which I've just left over there. So excuse me a second. And here I am back, just as magic. I didn't really disappear from the world. So I. This is a book called uh, Damnable Tales, and it's a collection of. It's uh, subtitled a folk horror anthology. I put that in the middle, and you can see I've got a little um, image of it there, as well. So this is collected and illustrated by Richard Wells, and Richard Wells is a, a well-known, uh, well-known in the folk horror and British horror scene, probably world horror scene now, specialising in folk horror. And he selected these and illustrated them. There's a load of fantastic illustrations in his uh, classic uh, lino cut style. So um, I'm going to read two short stories from this tonight in this live broadcast. And I'm going to do two stories rather than one long story because when I'm talking to you like this, I cannot actually see your comments. So you could be saying, uh, I can't hear you, or the camera's gone off. or And this did happen in the first live broadcast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read one short story. I'm going to check the comments, see if you've got any questions or anything like that. So if you do have any questions... Um, I'm hoping there won't be tons, so I'll have to scroll, because I'll have to disappear off screen to look at it, and then I'll read the second, okay. So the first one that I'm going to do, lovely, there's an illustration there, is uh, The Music on the Hill by Saki. And this story was first published in the collection The Chronicles of Clovis in 1911, okay. So The Music on the Hill by Saki. Sylvia Selton ate her breakfast in the morning room at Yesney with a pleasant sense of ultimate victory, such as a fervent Ironside might have permitted himself on the morrow of Worcester fight. She was scarcely pugnacious by temperament, but belonged to that more successful class of fighters who are pugnacious by circumstance. Fate had willed that her life should be occupied with a series of small struggles usually with the odds slightly against her. And usually she had just managed to come through winning, and now she felt she had brought her hardest and certainly her most important struggle to a successful issue, to have married Mortimer Selton, dead Mortimer, as his more intimate enemies called him, in the teeth of the cold hostility of his family and in spite of his unaffected indifference to women was indeed an achievement that had needed some determination and adroitness to carry through. Yesterday she had brought her victory to its concluding stage by wrenching her husband away from town and its group of satellite watering places and settling him down in the vocabulary of her kind, in this remote wood-girt manor farm 
which was his country house. You'll never get Mortimer to go, his mother had said carpingly. But if he once goes, he'll stay. Yesney throws almost as much a spell over him as town does. One can understand what holds him to town, but Yesney... And the dowager had shrugged her shoulders. There was a sombre, almost savage wildness about Yesney that was certainly not likely to appeal to town-bred tastes. And Sylvia, notwithstanding her name, was accustomed to nothing much more sylvan than leafy Kensington. She looked on the country as something excellent and wholesome in its way, which was apt to become troublesome if you encouraged it overmuch. Distrust of town life had been a new thing with her, born of her marriage with Mortimer, and she had watched with satisfaction the gradual fading of what she called the German street look in his eyes as the woods and heather of Yesney had closed in on them yesternight. Her willpower and strategy had prevailed. Mortimer would stay. Outside the morning-room windows was a triangular slope of turf, which the indulgent might call a lawn, and beyond its low hedge a neglected fuchsia bushes, sorry, and beyond its low hedge of neglected fuchsia bushes a steeper slope of heather and bracken dropped down into cavernous combes overgrown with oak and yew. In its wild open savagery there seemed a stealthy linking of the joy of life with the terror of unseen things. Sylvia smiled complacently as she gazed with a school of art appreciation at the landscape, and then of a sudden she almost shuddered. It is very wild, she said to Mortimer, who had joined her. One uh, could almost think that in such a place the worship of Pan had never quite died out. The worship of Pan never has died out, said Mortimer. Other, newer gods have drawn aside his votaries from time to time, but he is the nature god to whom all must come back at last. He has been called the father of all the gods, but most of his children have been stillborn. Sylvia was religious in an honest, vaguely devotional kind of way, and did not like to hear her beliefs spoken of as mere aftergrowths. But it was at least something new and hopeful to hear dead Mortimer speak with such energy and conviction on any subject. You don't really believe in Pan, she asked incredulously. I've been a fool in most things, said Mortimer quietly, but I'm not such a fool as not to believe in Pan when I'm down here. And if you're wise, you won't disbelieve in him too boastfully while you're in his country. It was not until a week later, when Sylvia had exhausted the attractions of the woodland walks around Yesney, that she ventured on a tour of inspection of the farm buildings. A farmyard suggested in her mind a scene of cheerful bustle with churns and flails and smiling dairymaids and reams of horses drinking knee-deep in duck-crowded ponds. As she wandered among the gaunt grey buildings of Yesney Manor Farm, her first impression was one of crushing stillness and desolation, as though she had happened on some lone, deserted homestead long given over to owls and cobwebs. Then came a sense of furtive, watchful hostility, the same shadow of unseen things that seemed to lurk in the wooded combs and coppices. From behind heavy doors and shuttered windows, came the restless stamp of hoof or rasp of chain halter, and at times a muffled bellow from some stalled beast. From a distant corner a shaggy dog watched her with intent, unfriendly eyes as she drew near it slipped quietly into its kennel and slipped out again as noiselessly as when she passed by. A few hens questing for food under a rick stole away under a gate at her approach. Sylvia felt as if she had come across any human beings in this wilderness of barn and byre, they would have fled wraith-like from her gaze. At last, turning a corner quickly, she came upon a living thing that did not fly from her. A stretch in a pool of mud was an enormous sow, gigantic beyond the town woman's wildest 
computation of swine flesh and speedily alert to resent and, if necessary, repel the unwanted intrusion. It was Sylvia's turn to make an unobtrusive retreat. As she threaded her way past rickyards and cowsheds and long blank walls, she started suddenly at a strange sound. The echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. Jan, the only boy employed on the farm, a tow-headed, wizen-faced yokel, was visibly at work on a potato clearing halfway up the nearest hillside, and Mortimer, when questioned, knew of no other probable or possible begetter of the hidden mockery that had ambushed Sylvia's retreat. The memory of that untraceable echo was added to her other impressions of a furtive, of a furtive sinister something that hung around Yesney. Of Mortimer she saw very little. Farm and woods and trout streams seemed to swallow him up from dawn till dusk. Once, following the direction she had seen him take in the morning, she came to an open space in a nut copse, further shut in by huge yew trees, in the centre of which stood a stone pedestal, surmounted by a small bronze figure of a youthful pan. It was a beautiful piece of workmanship, but her attention was chiefly held by the fact that a newly cut bunch of grapes had been placed as an offering at its feet. Grapes were none too plentiful at the manor house, and Sylvia snatched the bunch angrily from the pedestal. Contemptuous annoyance dominated her thoughts as she strolled slowly homeward, and then gave way to a sharp feeling of something that was very near fright. Across a thick tangle of undergrowth a boy's face was scowling at her, brown and beautiful, with unutterably evil eyes. It was a lonely pathway. All pathways round Yesney were lonely for the matter, for that matter, and she sped forward without waiting to give a closer scrutiny to this sudden apparition. It was not till she had reached the house that she discovered that she had dropped the bunch of grapes in her flight. I saw a youth in the wood today, she told Mortimer that evening, a brown faced and uh, rather handsome, but a scoundrel to look at her. A gypsy lad, I suppose. A reasonable theory, said Mortimer, only there aren't any gypsies in these parts at present. Then who was he? asked Sylvia, and as Mortimer appeared to have no theory of his own, she passed on to recount her finding of the votive offering. I suppose it was your doing, she observed. It's a harmless piece of lunacy, but people would think you dreadfully silly if they knew of it. Did you meddle with it in any way? asked Mortimer. I, I, I threw the grapes away. It seemed so silly, said Sylvia, watching Mortimer's impassive face for a sign of annoyance. I don't think you are wise to do that, he said reflectively. I've heard it said that the wood gods are rather horrible to those who molest them. Horrible, perhaps, to those who believe in them, but uh, you see, I don't, retorted Sylvia. All the same, said Mortimer, in his even, dispassionate tone, I should avoid the woods and orchards if I were you, and give a wide berth to the horned beasts on the farm. It was all nonsense, of course, but in that lonely wood-girt spot, nonsense seemed able to rear a bastard brood of uneasiness. Mortimer, said Sylvia suddenly, I think we will go back to town uh, sometime soon. Her victory had not been so complete as she had supposed. It had carried her on to ground that she was already anxious to quit. I don't think you'll ever go back to town, said Mortimer. He seemed to be paraphrasing his mother's prediction of, as of himself. Sylvia noted with dissatisfaction and some self-contempt that the course of her next afternoon's ramble took her instinctively clear of the network of woods. As to the horned cattle, Mortimer's warning was scarcely needed, for she had always regarded them as of doubtful neutrality at the best. Her imagination unsexed the most matronly dairy cows and turned them into bulls liable to see red at any moment. The ram, 
who fed in the narrow paddock below the orchards she had adjudged after ample and cautious prob um, probation, to be of docile temper. Today, however, she decided to leave his docility untested, for the, usually un for the usually tranquil beast was roaming with every sign of restlessness from corner to corner of his meadow. A low, fitful piping, as of some reedy flute, was coming from the depth of a neighbouring copse, and there seemed to be some subtle connection between the animal's restless pacing and the wild music from the wood. Sylvia turned her steps in an upward direction and climbed the heather-clad slopes that stretched in rolling shoulders high above Yesney. She had left the piping notes behind her, but across the wooded combs at her feet the wind brought her another kind of music, the straining bay of hounds in full chase. Yesney was just on the outskirts of the Devon and Somerset country, and the hunted deer sometimes came that way. Sylvia could presently see a dark body breasting hill after hill and sinking again and again out of sight as he crossed the combs, while behind him steadily swelled that relentless chorus, and she grew tense with the excited sympathy that one feels for any hunted thing in whose capture one is not directly interested. And at last he broke through the outermost line of oak scrub and fern and stood panting in the open, a fat September stag carrying a well-furnished head. His obvious course was to drop down to the broad pools of Undercombe and thence make his way towards the Red Deer's favourite sanctuary, the sea. To Sylvia's surprise, however, he turned his head to the upland slope and came lumbering resolutely onward over the heather. It will be dreadful, she thought. The hounds will pull him down under my very eyes. But the music of the pack seemed to have died away for a moment, and in its place she heard again that wild piping which rose now on this side, now on that, as though urging the failing stag to a final effort. Sylvia stood well aside from his path, half hidden in a thick growth of wattle bushes, and watched him swing stiffly upward, his flanks dark with sweat, the coarse hair on his neck showing light by contrast. The pipe music shrilled suddenly around her, seeming to come from the bushes at her very feet, and at the same moment the great beast slewed round and bore directly down upon her. In an instant her pity for the hunted animal was changed to wild terror at her own danger. The thick heather roots mocked her scrambling efforts at flight, and she looked frantically downward for a glimpse of oncoming hounds. The huge antler spikes were within a few yards of her, and in a flash of numbing fear she remembered Mortimer's warning to beware of horned beasts on the farm. And then, with a quick throb of joy, she saw that she was not alone. A human figure stood a few paces aside, knee-deep in the wattle bushes. Drive it off! she shrieked. But the figure made no answering movement. The antlers drove straight at her breast. The acrid smell of the hunted animal was in her nostrils, but her eyes were filled with the horror of something she saw other than her oncoming death and in her ears ran the echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you so I'm going to read another one now. The Devil of the, from the same book. Um, the Devil of the Mar Devil of the Marsh by H. B. Marriott Watson. But first, I'm going to check to see if there are any comments to see if there are any problems with that. So I'll be right back. Okay. Good. Excellent. 
Right, it seems to be working. So let us continue. This is, as I said, the devil, just not the devil, Devil of the Marsh by H.B. Marriott Watson, first published in the collection Diogenes of London and Other Fantasies and Sketches, 1893. And as you can see, uh, Richard Wells has done another um, drawing here, make sure there's no light on it. And, and the whole book is, is full of these beautiful lino cuts. Uh, I don't get a kickback for saying this is a lovely book and you can buy it. I'm not sure how many, uh, you might be able to get the hardback copy uh, second hand now, but certainly you can buy the, I was in uh, Waterstones, in actually in Foils in London about a month ago and they had it in then. Anyway, but I've seen it in, in Waterstones in Carlisle and all about and I'm sure you can order it. So uh, yeah, Richard Wells, uh, Damnable Tales, let's go on. Devil of the Marsh. It was nigh upon dusk when I drew close to the great marsh, and already the white vapours were about, riding across the sunken levels like ghosts in a churchyard. Though I had set forth in a mood of wild delight, I had sobered in a lonely ride across the moor, and was now uneasily alert. As my horse jerked down the grassy slopes that fell away to the jaws of the swamp, I could see thin streams of mist rise slowly, hover like wraiths above the long rushes, and then, turning gradually more material, go blowing heavily away across the flat. The appearance of the place at this desolate hour, so remote from human society, and so darkly significant of evil presences, struck me with a certain wonder that she should have chosen this spot for our meeting. She was a familiar of the moors where I had invariably encountered her, but it was like her arrogant caprice to test my devotion by some such dreary assignation. The wide and horrid prospect depressed me beyond reason, but the fact of her neighbourhood drew me on, and my spirits mounted at the thought that at last she was to put me in possession of herself. Tethering my horse upon the verge of the swamp, I soon discovered the path that crossed it, and entering struck out boldly for the heart. The track could have been little used, for the reeds, which stood high above the level of my eyes upon either side, straggled everywhere across in low arches, through which I dodged and broke my way with some inconvenience and much impatience. A full half-hour I was solitary in that wilderness, and when at last a sound other than my own footsteps broke the silence, the dusk had fallen. I was moving very slowly at the time, with a mind half disposed to turn from the melancholy expedition, when it seemed to me now, which it seemed to me now, must surely be a cruel jest she had played upon me. While some reluctance held me, I was suddenly arrested by a hoarse croaking which broke out on my left, sounding somewhere from the reeds in the black mire. A little further it came again from close at hand, and when I had passed on a few more steps in wonder and perplexity, I heard it for the third time. I stopped and listened, but the marsh was as a grave, and so taking the noise for the signal of some raucous frog, I resumed my way. But in a little the croaking was repeated, and coming quickly to a stand, I pushed the reeds aside and peered into the darkness. I could see nothing, but at the immediate moment of my pause, I thought I detected the sound of some body trailing through the rushes. My distaste for the adventure grew with this suspicion, and had it not been for my delirious infatuation, I had assuredly turned back and ridden home. The ghastly sound pursued me at intervals along the track, until, at last, irritated beyond endurance by the sense of this persistent and invisible company, I broke into a sort of run. This, it seemed, the creature, whatever it was, could not achieve, for I heard no more of it, and continued my way in peace. 
My path at length ran out from among the reeds upon the smooth flat of which she had spoken, and here my heart quickened, and the gloom of the dreadful place lifted. The flat lay in the very centre of the marsh, and here and there, in it a gaunt bush or withered tree, rose like a spectre against the white mists. At the further end I fancied some kind of building loomed up, but the fog, which had been gathering ever since my entrance upon the passage, sailed down upon me at that moment, and the prospect went out with suddenness. As I stood waiting for the clouds to pass, a voice cried to me out of its centre, and I saw her next second, with bands of mist swirling about her body, come rushing to me from the darkness. She put her long arms about me, and drawing her close, I looked into her deep eyes. Far down in them, it seemed to me, I could discern a mystic laughter dancing in the wells of light, and I had that ecstatic sense of nearness to some spirit of fire which was wont to possess me at her contact. At last, she said, at last, my beloved, I caressed her. Why, said I, tingling at the nerves, why have you put this dolorous journey between us? And what mad freak is your presence in this swamp? She uttered her silver laugh and nestled to me again. I am the creature of this place, she answered. This is my home. I have sworn you should behold me in my native sin, ere you ravished me away. Come then, said I, I have seen. Let there, be an, let there be an end to this. I know you, what you are. This marsh chokes up my heart. God forbid you should spend more of your days here. Come. You are in haste, she cried. There is yet much to learn. Look, my friend, she said, you who know me, what I am. This is my prison, and I have inherited its properties. Have you no fear? For answer I pulled her to me, and her warm lips drove out the horrid humours of the night, but the swift passage of a flickering mockery over her eyes struck me as a flash of lightning, and I grew chill again. I have the marsh in my blood, she whispered, the marsh and the fog of it. Think ere you vow to me, for I am the cloud in a starry night. A lithe and lovely creature, palpable of warm flesh, she lifted her magic face to mine and besought me plaintively with these words. The dews of the nightfall hung on her lashes and seemed to plead with me for her forlorn and solitary plight. Behold, I cried, witch or devil of the marsh, you shall come with me. I have known you on the moors, a roving apparition of beauty. Nothing more I know, nothing more I ask. I care not what this dismal haunt means, not what these strange and mystic eyes. You have powers and senses above me. Your sphere and habits are as mysterious and incomprehensible as your beauty. But that, I said, is mine, and the world that is mine shall be yours also. She moved her head nearer to me with an antic gesture, and her gleaming eyes glanced up at me with a sudden flash, the similitude, great heavens, of a hooded snake. Starting, I fell away, but at that moment she turned her face and set it fast towards the fog that came rolling in thick volumes over the flat. Noiselessly the, great noiselessly the great cloud crept down upon us, and all dazed and troubled I watched her, watching it in silence. It was as if she awaited some omen of horror, and I too trembled in the fear of its coming. Then, suddenly out of the night, 
issued the hoarse and hideous croaking I had heard upon my passage. I reached out my arm to take her hand, but in an instant the mists broke over us, and I was groping in the vacancy. Something like panic took hold of me, and beating through the blind obscurity, I rushed over the flat, calling upon her. In a little, in a little the swirl went by, and I perceived her upon the margin of the swamp, her arm raised as an imperious command. I ran to her, but stopped, amazed and shaken by a fearful sight. Low by the dripping reeds crouched a small, squat thing in the likeness of a monstrous frog coughing and choking in its throat. As I stared, the creature rose upon its legs and disclosed a horrid human resemblance. Its face was white and thin, with long black hair, its body gnarled and twisted as with the ague of a thousand years. Shaking, it whined in a breathless voice, pointing a skeleton finger at the woman by my side. Your eyes were my guide, it quavered. Do you think that after all these years I have no knowledge of your eyes. Lo, is there aught of evil in you I am not instructed in? This is the hell you designed for me, and now you would leave me to a greater the wretch paused and panting leaned upon a bush while she stood silent mocking him with her eyes and soothing my terror with her soft touch here he cried turning to me hear the tale of this woman that you may know her as she is she is the presence of the marshes woman or devil i know not but only that the accursed marsh has crept into her soul and she herself is become its evil spirit she herself that lives and grows young and beautiful by it has its full power to blight and chill and slay i who was once as you are have this knowledge what bones lie in this black swamp who can say but she she has drained of health she has drained of mind and of soul what is between her and her desire that she should not drain also of life she has made me a devil in her hell and now she would leave me to my solitary pain and go search for another victim but she shall not he screamed through his chattering teeth she shall not my hell is also hers she shall not her smiling and troubled eyes left his face and turned to me. She put out her arms, swaying towards me, and so fervid and so great a light grow, glowed in her face that, as one distraught of superhuman means, I took her into my embrace. And then the madness seized me. Woman or devil, I said, I will go with you. Of what account this pitiful past? Blight me, even as that wretch. So be only you are with me. She laughed, and disengaging herself, leaned half clinging to me towards the coughing creature by the mire. Come, I cried, catching her by the waist. Come. She laughed again, a silver, ringing laugh. She moved with me slowly across the flat to where the track started for the portals of the marsh. 
She laughed and clung to me. But at the edge of the track, I was startled by a shrill hoarse screaming, and behold, from my very feet, that loathsome creature rose up and wound his long black arms about her, shrieking and crying in his pain. Stooping, I pushed him from her skirts, and with one sweep of my arm drew her across the pathway. As her face passed mine, her eyes were, wild, were wide and smiling. Then, of a sudden, the still mist enveloped us once more. But ere it descended, I had a glimpse of that contorted figure trembling on the margin, the white face drawn and full of desolate pain. At the sight, an icy shiver ran through me, and then, through the yellow gloom, the shadow of her darted past me to the further side. I heard the hoarse cough, the dim noise of a struggle, a swishing sound, a thin cry, and then the sucking of the slime over something in the rushes. I leapt forward, and once again the fog thinned, and I beheld her, woman or devil, standing upon the verge and peering with smiling eyes into the foul and sickly bog. With a sharp cry wrung from my nerveless soul, I turned and fled down the narrow way from that accursed spot, and as I ran the thickening fog closed round me, and I heard far off and lessening still the silver sound of her mocking laughter. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. Come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Come back. You tried to get into the locked room. Tried to get into the locked room. How do the dead come back, Mother? How do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? I don't know. I had a girlfriend like that once. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we used to meet in the marsh. Uh, no, that's not true. So uh, there we are, finished for tonight. This is really the second rehearsal for the Halloween Live, which is next Tuesday, and I'm going to do. Um, after much debate and thanks to Terry for this suggestion and his vote of confidence and others uh, but he knows who he is um, um, I'm going to do The Rats in the Walls by H.P. Lovecraft cause it's a Lovecraftian kind of evening is it Halloween so 9pm UK time 5 hours to the west of the US and then further over Australia probably I think it's about 8am uh, in Australia uh, the next day, so not Halloween. Anyway, it's very confusing, all this. So remember, merchandise now. We're going to get more merchandise. I've got some badges coming, or pins, uh, as uh, some people call them. Uh, these are the three postcards. You get these three postcards, focus, uh, and the sticker. Uh, you can get in my Etsy shop. I see the title's disappeared. I don't know where that's gone. Uh, it's a classic ghost podcast on Etsy. Uh, you can get these, and I can mail them across the world because they're only light. And when the when the badges come in, when the pins come in, we can do that too. They're only little. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Um, thank you for tuning in. It will be available as a as a recording on YouTube and Facebook um, in the future. Okay, see you next Tuesday for Halloween and the rats in the walls. <coughs> oh, then my control is here. <coughs> I don't know how to switch it off, I realise. I realise that now. I'm going to have to edit this bit off.